Hello everyone, back with a new video. I'm going to cover uh, a little bit on mentoring, a little bit more on mentoring. Uh, same disclaimer, you know, uh, nothing meant for legal purposes. I'm talking about history, uh, stories, you know, of the past. and uh, This is going to be a little bit on the way I did things or how I would teach someone some things. And also, I'm going to use uh, some information that I got from others. We always say we never stop learning. I never do. I'm always getting some little tips here and there. And so I share them, you know. And uh, most of the people I get them from, my friends, they don't mind me sharing them. And, uh, you know, if it helps, great. But, uh, you know... Modern day mentoring, there's, there can be more benefits to it on both sides, whether you're the mentor or the mentee, due to the fact with technology, you know, uh, you can share information or ask questions, uh, you know, in real time. Uh, I guess you could even FaceTime somebody, you know. Or at least message them, call them. We've all, you know, been used, you can call, you know, that's what we used to do back in the day, talk on the phone. But that cost you if it was long distance. Now it doesn't cost any more than it normally costs anyways. And uh, if nothing else, a message or uh, or text, you know, even an email. Uh, which which you know because people work or whatever you know they don't have to wait till they're off work or they don't have to wait till you know you, you can do it on the spot and the one good thing about on the spot is and the thing with mentoring is it's most effective if the person has the dog right in front of them we talk about hands-on we talk about in real time it's not effective unless you have the product there being the dog to to practice on or take the information that's given to you and see it in real time you know in the video i did show and go the one thing i forgot to mention is someone can put a dog in keep they can go through the whole keep but if all you're doing is showing the dog say confirmation and you're not seeing the results of that keep, you really don't know if it was effective or not, if the dog is in tip-top shape or not. Now, there's a lot to be said going through the keep and how the dog responded and how he recouped and how he was fed and how he looks at the end. That may be all good, may look beautiful, but without exerting some kind of performance... In modern day, it's weight pull, it's, you know, hunting, it's treadmill race or wall climb or something like that. Then uh, you, you're not 100% sure how the keep went. And even speaking of the past, it was the same for us. Now, I will say, you know, a, a experienced conditioner can tell if his dog's in good shape. And he can tell if he missed it some. Or if he passed the peak a little bit. Or if he's coming up to peak. You know. But. Even with that. There's been plenty of times where. After a bad performance. The person will say. I don't know what happened. What happened. Then they have to troubleshoot what they did. And you know. Why the dog underperformed or performed the way it did because any good handler knows that a dog may look well and feel well and make weight and all that but when something goes wrong it's usually the conditioner's fault and I've done it and I know experienced guys that have done it you backtrack and you see well what was the problem where was the problem, you know? And I think that's one of the one of the things that a, that a conditioner 
has to be able to do. And if you have a mentor, and, and let's say it's someone starting out or they're not that well versed in conditioning, uh, that person should be able to get a hold of the mentor if they have a problem, troubleshooting through the keep and say, you know, uh, this and this and that and that. And, you know, what do you think it is? What, what can you help me with? And it's always paying attention to the dog. You know, I hear a lot of people, you know, all the keeps were great. All the keeps, every time they did a dog and perfect condition and, you know, killers and did this, that, and the performance all the time. That's not true. Like I've said before, the best conditioners I know, they're consistent. And most of the time, they do a good job, and a great job. Sometimes they don't. That's across the board. It doesn't matter to me what anybody says. That's what happened with me, and that's what's happened with the best conditioners that I know, and some of them are very famous dogmen. I've seen them. And uh, they have to troubleshoot the problem. Sometimes after the fact, like I said, what went wrong? Could be a lot of things, you know. Something that they didn't notice. Something that, you know, because the dogs are the way they are, they can't tell you. It doesn't show up until it really counts, you know. So, that's important. It's one thing for me to give my, uh, give, uh, you know, advice. But if I'm giving to advice to someone on the other end and they don't have a dog there, it's just information, general information. They would have to have a dog there to, you know, go through what I told them, listen to what I told them, and then test it on the dog or check for this or check for that, you know. And like I said, that's the beauty of today's time. You can do that in real time. For example, with my keep, everybody knows my keep's available. Still is, always will be. I've had nothing but good feedback from it. It's helped a lot of people. They tell me that it works. And uh, one of the things is they can always get a hold of me. What does this mean? What does that mean? Hey, I had to read it over and over and over again before I got it. Or I had to test this. Or this is not complete. What do you mean by this? What can I do here? Can I do this instead of that? A lot of people can't run their dogs on a bike. Like I did. It doesn't matter. You can still use the method, the technique, the mindset, the example to work your dog, whatever it is you're doing, whether it's on a treadmill, whether it's on a, a, a you know, a slap mill or a carpet mill or a, a cat mill or, you know, you're out there hand walking them and running them with yourself is just how do you apply it? There's differences of all of them. But how do you apply what you're doing based on what I'm telling you to do? Uh, I'll give some examples. Just And this is going to be all over the place, right? So I had a friend <clears throat> was conditioned a dog. And the dog wasn't a hard worker. And he was trying to get her to work. What can I do? Bait her, this and that. And, and, and do all that. And, you know, get her to... Get her to, you know move faster, run faster, and work harder, and all that stuff. My advice was leave her alone. Don't bait her. Don't do nothing. That's her pace. Let her run her pace. She knows what she's doing. She knows when to exert herself or not. And if she never exerts herself, that's how she does her, ho her road work. And I told him this too. By the end of the keep, she'll probably pick the pace up a little bit. She'll probably... Run a little bit faster on her own. She'll just do that on her own. And that's exactly what happened. But it took him showing me a video of how she was running. Or a tape, whatever it was at the time. How she was running. For me to look at her pace. To give him that information. She wasn't lazy. She was just smart. 
She wasn't a dog that didn't like to work. She just didn't overexert herself. As it turns out, she has great air anyways. So you, he didn't really have to put that much air into her in that way. He didn't have to push her because, you know, that was her method of working. Patient, a lot of poise, a lot of style, great air, intelligence. So sometimes you got to just leave them alone and let them work their pace, you know. Uh, you know, it's like when uh, you're working a dog, uh, you're teaching a pup or a young dog or whatever it is to run the mill. You might have to bait them with a toy or you put a, a, some people will put their chihuahua in there and makes a dog run. Or even use kibble to get them to run and uh, use whatever method along with their voice commands to get them to run. But I tell people, after you do that, don't, don't bait them anymore. After they know they're supposed to work the mill and they enjoy working the mill, don't use something to bait them with. Let them run their pace. And when they want to pick the pace up, that's when you encourage it. It's like Pavlov's dog. When you're baiting them or teaching them, you use them voice commands when you get a positive reaction out of them. And they'll connect that voice command with what they're doing. Oh, he likes that I'm running, so I'm going to run fast or whatever. I'm going to pick up the pace. You know, going from a walk to a trot to a, a you know, a run to a sprint. Some don't never sprint. Some do sprint. And if they go balls out, I, I wouldn't encourage them. I wouldn't bait them. I wouldn't do nothing. I would want them to learn, hit that sprint, go 100 miles an hour. And when you break your that win or catch that second win or whatever you want to call it, uh, allow them to do it. Don't try and make them pick up the pace that they were before. Because that's, that's their body reacting and telling them, hey, I need to slow this down. If I want to keep moving, i got to slow my pace down. So it's not about always encouraging the dog to work and always encouraging the dog to work. It's going to raise their stress level. It's going to raise their heart rate and the heavy breathing and all that. And you don't want to have them do that all the time during the workout. A show doesn't go that way. And they can go for a long time if they're in good shape at a good clip, a fast clip. But they can't keep it up forever. So you have to have the eye for it and pay attention to the dog and see what they're doing. And you may have to bait them to teach them how to do it or, or to introduce them to the mill or the cat, whatever it is they're working. Uh, but then I would back off on that part of it. Even on a cat mill, you see they have the bait in front of them all the time. And the dog will chase that bait. Whether it's a hide, whether it's a chicken in a cage or whatever. They'll do that. But because that cat mill is like road work, they're going to hit their pace and it's going to go back and forth. They're going to slow down, pick it up, slow down, pick it up like that. You just allow them to do that. So... uh that, that's a little bit about mentoring that way. And the point of that is when uh, people are asking me questions or they have the dog in front of them, they can send me a video. And I can tell them what I see. For example, one guy said, it is a video of my dog, what do you think? Working. The dog was pushing it hard. He was gassed out. His tongue was hanging out to the side. And he had a lot of foam around his mouth. Hard workout. So what did I tell the person? I told them, you pushed them too far. That's too much work at one time. He's played out. Stop the workout. Rest him a day and then get back on it. And the next time you work him, don't let him get that far. Time it to whatever it was where he was blowed out. Right? And then don't let it get that far. Don't let him go that long. 
and you'll see better results from it you know and uh that's just that's just one aspect another one send me another vid hey what do you think dog's running good smooth his heart rate's up his breathing's up his tongue straight out it's, he's not all tired i said that's a good clip that's a good clip and if you keep going you'll see they're laboring more and more tongue will spread out or cup up you know and then that's when it starts going to the side because they're trying to get as much air as they can and they move their tongue out of the way or just you know <laughs> like that it's just it's just too much so don't let them get to that point and i told him if you can keep them at that pace or he stays at that pace or he goes up and down with that pace and his tongue doesn't change that's how you know you can add a little more time as you go he went this far on the mill or on running, whatever it was. Uh, today, uh, tomorrow, he did a few more minutes. Next day, a few more. You can rest them, do whatever. Next day, pick it up like that, you know. Because you you have to be able to have the experience to know when, when too much is too much. But you also have to know how not to let it get to that point. The only way to do it, honestly, is to see them at that point. So it does have some benefits when you play them out like that or you burn them out like that. That's just an observation that you want to see so you know what he looks like. Take away the clock. You're not looking at the clock and seeing how long it took in that respect. But I'm observing the dog and see how he behaves leading up to that point, at that point, and after that point. Meaning how long, if I blew him out like that, how long does it take him to recoup afterwards? And you'll notice as you increase the work and you don't let him get played out that way. When you take him off, even though he's running for a longer period of time or a longer distance. It doesn't take that long to recuperate like he did when you blew him out. So that's another thing. Another tip, and this is, uh, you know, this video was inspired by my buddy Ruben, and this is a tip he gave me. You know, back in the day, it was an old-timer talking to him. And back in the day, you know, they didn't have where you could test the blood, you know. They did, certain people did, even back, Tudor and Sadler did that, but they had a horse vet that could be trusted with the dogs and all that stuff. A lot of people, even myself, didn't take advantage of vets because i didn't trust them to not say nothing about my dogs or how the way they look i was just protecting my dog and myself they didn't have the in-home test kits where you could do that i didn't have access to a, a vet tech like some of the guys my contemporaries did you know where they could test their blood i just had to do it by eye how they feeling how they look how's the conditioning how's the recuperating you know how's the weight uh, taking place, you know, and, uh, so the tip he gave him was take your thumb, press the inside of the dog's palate, you know, when you do that, it turns white, and just like you pull on the skin, you check for moisture, how they're dry, you pull on the skin, and how fast it drops down, or how slow it drops down, it gives you idea, gives you an idea of their hydration, right, well, you do that with the inside of their palette on the inside of the palette when you press on it, it turns white just like when some people you press on their skin it turns white and when the blood comes back uh it the color of their skin goes back to normal same with that palette you press on it, it turns white do your little count see how long it takes uh to go back the color of the inside of their palette to go back to normal if it's generally the same as when you pull the skin you know a three count like I said, I never counted, but I just watched it. Should come back. Relatively short time. Then you know your blood count's good. That was his way of doing it. I don't know if there's anything behind that, but that was his way of doing it. it worked for him. And if it takes too long, you're, according to him, your blood count's too low because it's taking a long time for the blood to come back to that where the skin is the uh, back to normal color. 
So it would be something to test, especially in today's time. You do both tests. If you have the opportunity to do a RBC count or whatever, or a HCT count or whatever, you have a little machine, test the count where you have an accurate count that you monitor. Test it against pushing on that. See if there's any validity to it. You know, That's the way to test things. But again, you have to have the dog there in front of you. It's one thing to get information, and we've talked about this on on different chats different channels and all that there's a ton of information out there you basically punch in just like you're talking or whatever anything you want to ask google and something will come up and depending on the way you word it you might get a different answer or get different information that's available but if you can't apply it in real time it's just information and knowledge that you're getting you have to be able to test it uh, it's like, you know, the the uh, drying the dog out or the moisture content, this or that, you know. They need water. You got to have water. A dog has to have water. That's the, that's the liquid of life. And we need it. Everything on this planet needs it, all that, right? But moisture in conditioning sense is more related to the electrolytes. So in my case, I used chicken broth or beef broth, right? Some kind of meat broth. Because that broth, along with the little vitamins it has and a little bit of protein and the fat in it or whatever, uh, also has electrolytes. If you don't, if you want to give them the broth, but you don't want the added fat to it, all you do is put it in the refrigerator, leave it overnight, the fat will collect at the top. It will harden. You just skim it. Or as you're making a broth or heating up a can of broth, you know, uh, I use, if you want to, you could use unsalted broth, you know, if you don't want the salt content. The salt helps them retain water, moisture. All you do is skim it, you know. You can look how to do that online. There's tons of ways to do it. You can use a paper towel. You can use a... Spoon, I just use a spoon to skim the fat off as it's cooking, boiling like that. But the simplest method is just put it up. It'll harden at the top. Take Now you have just the juice of it. <clears throat> Most people will say, you know, I let them have as much water, water as they want. I don't take their water away. I have water available all the time for them. Generally, that's true. But you don't have the water all the time. You can't leave the water there. All the time in this respect. After you do your workout. Dog. Is. Thirsty. Right. So if they haven't cooled down yet. And you put the water in front of them. They're going to drink a ton of it. They're going to drink a bunch of it. More than what they need. But if you do your workout. Walk them out to cool them down. Do your rub down. Feed them. All that. And you put water out there. Generally, if they're in good shape, especially when they're coming to the peak, they won't drink no water. They don't want it. So we all monitor the fluid intake of our dogs. And I use the chicken broth because it has the electrolytes. That's what replenishes the moisture in them. Right? Look up electrolytes. It's the magnesium and... and copper or whatever i forgot what what it was but they need electrolytes you know uh some people will use pedialyte some people will use gatorade and it's anywhere from six ounces eight ounces 12 ounces of liquid right it's not a lot but it's enough to replenish them that's why you see uh, football players, you know, Gatorade was specifically developed for football players. So throughout the game, they can take a sip here and there. You notice they're not guzzling it down. You can't perform with a belly full of water properly, any kind of liquid, you know. It's just to take a swig to replenish those electrolytes that they were burning on during the game. It's a four-hour game, so take that into consideration. That's all I was doing when I added fluid to their feet. Eight ounces, it's a cup, it's not much. That's a good long piss if they want to 
if you want them to, you know, if you're monitoring their weight, you know. So that was important to me. But again, unless you have a dog in front of you, you can't tell. Because you could, I mean, you could test it. Go run the hell out of your dog, work them hard. Before, right when you get them off the mill or you get home, put a bowl of water in front of them. They're going to drink. Most of the time, they're going to lap it down as much as they can. And then the next workout, do what I told you. Run them, whatever it is, hard workout, whatever it is. Walk them out, cool them down to their heart rate's relatively back to normal and their breathing is relatively back to normal. Do your little rub down, 15 minutes, a half hour, whatever it is. And don't even feed them then, but give them at least 45 minutes to an hour after their workout. Put the water in front of them. See how they drink. They may lap a little bit. A lot of times they won't drink nothing. But after all that, if they drink a lot of water after they're cooled down, now you have a problem. They might have a fever. And you could take their temperature, you know. Because what happens when they run hot is uh, they don't have enough blood going, they don't have enough oxygen coming in. Uh, and the blood is not distributing it throughout their body to keep them cool. That's why they run hot where you see dogs can't breathe this and that. A lot of it could be, because, especially if they're overweight or something like that. But even a dog that's down in weight, if you run them hot like that, that's the reason why. They're not getting enough oxygen in for that oxygen to be distributed throughout their body for them to remain cooled down. Now, if you do do that right, then you can put them in a hard workout, long time, an hour, two hours, whatever it is, and they don't run hot like that. They don't blow out like that. So that's the measure of that. If, uh, and, and like I said, you got to see the results of it. So there's a lot of benefits to having a mentor or anybody asking questions, you know, if the person is willing to, to share with you, uh, there's a lot more benefit to it. If you have a dog there that you're actually conditioning or just exercising so you can test these theories, test these examples and see the results of it. You know, if you're, if you're using whatever kind of apparatus or just hand walking, What's the benefits of hand walking? People say cardio, which is true, and endurance, which is true if you go long enough, you know. For me, it's just loosening them up, getting them uh, ready to do the hard work. There's that bond. There's that opportunity to see any problems with your dog's pad or his gait or his focus, you know. Their eyes should be clear. Even on a long walk, if something's wrong, with a the dog, their their eyes will start glazing. Could be they have too much weight on them, and it affects their breathing because you know it's a long walk. You see them; they're out there, their tongues hanging out, you know, and, and you see their eyes dilate a little bit, or you see them get cloudy a little bit, you know. That's a measure to tell you, okay, I can walk this far, and this is going to happen. His eyes are going to look this way. His gait's not going to be springy and sprite and uh you know uh he might be you know kind of uh disinterested or having trouble walking properly his step isn't right he's dragging his feet all this stuff that hand walking has a benefit of and all you do is take those examples that you see with the dog right in front of you and when you do some sprinting or running or you use a mill or a e mill or the cat mill or you use some spring pole or flirt pole worker like that it, it it'll let you know because you've done all this hand walking where the breaking point is for the dog how he behaves up after a certain amount of work or time and it just plays over into when you put hard work harder work on him a lot of benefits to it you know i did a thing on hand walking that for me it doesn't 
get their heart rate up enough and their breathing up enough to where, you know, I can't run that far or that fast with a dog. They could outrun me for days, you know. I, I uh, some dogs, they don't pull all the time where they're just steady dragging you like that to get that heart rate up. Most don't do that. Some do. I had one or two that did, even though most of mine were hard workers. On a walk, yeah, they pull a little bit and they stay out in front and they do what they do. But it's not that dig down deep, hard pulling like that. I had one or two that did do that. Even my friend had one. She, she pulled like that just going on a walk. Nothing to bait her. Nothing in front of her. Just her on a natural walk. And she would even cry like she was looking at a another dog or something. There's nothing in front of her. That was just her attitude. She was just so intense and so eager to work that she would cry and whine while she's working, moving forward, looking for something or expecting something to show up. Beautiful bitch and a great animal. And uh, But they don't all come out that way, you know. So uh, those are some of the benefits of hand walking, but some of the things that you need to do something else, you know. If all you can do, let's say you don't have any equipment. You can't, you're not in a position to ride a bike. You don't have a cat mill. You don't have an ATV to run your dog or you don't have a vehicle or the area to run your dog. And you don't have a swim tank or, a, uh, uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, a track or anything like that, or a cat mill, or none of that stuff. All you can do basically is some hand walking. I would add flirt pole to it. Flirt pole is a high intense workout. It's uh, quick, improves their reflexes, gets their heart rate up, but you can't do that either. You can't push them like that too much. So as long as you had that with some sprint work and a little bit of road work, some hand walking, see how it works. What are you trying to do to the dog? You trying to build strength? Well, you can do that with the hand walking. You trying to build endurance? You can do that with the hand walking. You trying to get their heart rate up? You can do that with a flirt pole. Just simple things like that. You could incorporate a spring pole with it, you know, if you got in your yard. Build up more strength, you know. But you want air too, and that that's the the hand walking helps a little bit with building up their air, you know. And most dogs, honestly, most pit bulls have pretty good air. It's kind of rare when you have one that doesn't have any air, he gets blowed out. Could be a physical problem, that thing in their throat where the passageway is not clear, so they're not taking in the proper amount of oxygen. That's rare. Could be the lung capacity of the dog or whatever it is. Or he's so intense he blows himself out. Whatever it is. But generally most pit bulls have good air. So anytime you work a dog. You're improving it a little bit. But not 100%. You can't expect them to be 100%. Unless they're just hog fat and they never done nothing. And you take a long time to build them up. And now you have 100% different in a dog. You had a fat lazy pig that never done nothing his whole life. And now you got a pretty good worker that likes to exercise and get out and do that that's the extreme but you understand what i'm saying they have pretty good air most of them do some have great air some not so good as others but most of them fall in that category they have pretty good air you know uh another uh video was sent to me you know the guy is doing his dog and did the workout and uh the dog was so played out that he fell out and laid down. He's breathing, his tongue hanging out. And the guy is giving the dog a rub down while he's laying on the ground. The dog's laying on the ground. I tell him, that, don't do that. that. Don't don't get the dog to the point where he can't stand and he's falling out. Don't work your dog so hard that what, when you put him up in his crate, in his pen, he goes in his doghouse and don't come out of the doghouse. He's so tired he can't even move. That'll kill your dog. And I don't mean kill it literally. You, I guess you could kill a dog working him too hard, whatever. But it, it defeats the whole purpose of the conditioning. We should always have something left. left. 
and they should always be eager to see you no matter what time of the day or night you go out there to see him. If you go out to see your dog, he's in his doghouse. He don't come out of his doghouse to greet you and you're doing a keep or conditioning program, you screwed up, you know. Uh, so don't get them, again, my advice was don't let the dog get that played out. Don't rub him down until he's cooled down. Definitely don't rub him down while he's on the, I mean, what are you going to do, rub one side and then roll him over to the other side? It's just, it was just too much. And the first time where I heard that term, or it was acknowledged to me, was early on in my career when I was working a dog, and it was actually a game foul cockfighter that, that came to the house, saw me work my dog, saw that I'd blowed him out, and he was a Mexican, so he said in Spanish, uh, lo pasaste, you passed it, you did too much. And I have to admit, you know, I kind of looked at him funny, like, what are you talking about, this and that? And uh, he just explained a little bit, don't do that much. You're doing too much. And, uh, you know, I was a little hard-headed, but I still took the information. And after thinking about it, I said, you know, that makes sense. The dog was played out. He was performing well before that. But once he got too tired, he still did the work, but it wasn't the same. He wasn't that eager, and he was breathing heavy with his tongue hanging out, slowing down on the workout. So I did what he told me. Put him up. Don't give him the... Don't work him tomorrow. Work him the next day, and if you bring him out the next day, and he's not eager to work 100%, jumping the walls, and rip raring to go, don't work him that day either. So in my keep, it's a six-day workout, one-day rest. But if it's if you need to give your dog more rest, then do it. That is just an example. And that is an example that I use for my dogs that were down in weight, regularly exercise, in good shape. And the only time they do anything during that keep is during the workout time. There's no playing with them. Uh, after the workout's done, I'm not going out there messing with them and petting with them and making them run the chain or anything like that. During the day, they're just relaxed. I have them off in a quiet place. No other dogs around, nobody to bother them, nothing. So when I say rest, I mean rest. And when I got my dogs on that program, they, they weren't allowed for something to get them worked up. Or the kids to go over there and mess with them and get them happy and playing and all that. Nope, they're resting the whole time. That's one of the ways I could get them to work six days a week and only have that one day off. But there were times when I had to give them another day off. It's all monitoring the dog, depending on how hard they work. And some guys just flat out will not do that. Now, Mr. Gray did it kind of, he did a different keep method and his keep was actually shorter than mine. If I did a full keep, it's six week, eight weeks. His is six. He works them hard, this and that, but he only gives them one day off. That that You can do that. Some people give two or three days off a week. There's no one way to do it. There's no <clears throat> only way to do it. But there's ways to where you can be consistent and get them in good shape. And if it means giving your dog two or three days off a week, depending on your method of conditioning and what you consider hard workouts or not hard workouts, all the everything that's involved, how you feed them, how much you feed them, and your method works, I don't argue with it. I don't argue with it. My keep has proved effective for me, and the feedback that I've been getting for several years now is positive so it's not just me that made it work and it's not just uh you know my time in the dogs other people are giving me good feedback on it which that just makes me happy you know it's kind of like if you put your dogs in someone else's hands it's one thing if you can be successful with your dogs but if you can put them in someone else's hands whether you give them a dog or sell them a dog whatever it is 
and they can do good with the dog. It's just a reflection on your breeding program, your family of dogs, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the type of dog you have. Just a different measure of the same thing. So, like I said, in today's time, when we have all this information, we can share this information. That's why I'm open to anybody. If they want help, I'll do what I can. But I'll also tell them it helps if you have the dog there and uh, you're actually going through the keep or you're doing for whatever it is, legal sports too, uh, that you can apply what I'm telling you on the fly. In real time. And, uh, you know, the other thing about uh, controlling, another thing about controlling water is, is, you know, and I won't get into this, I'll just mention it because some people use what they call a water keep and they give one ounce of water per body pound of the dog every day, you know. That has proven to, to work for them. I didn't give them that much water because, like I said, I put a little bit in their feed. And then during the day, yeah, I left it out there for them to drink whenever they want. In my mind, if the dog's thirsty, he's going to drink. If the dog doesn't want water, he's not going to drink it. But do we control the moisture intake? Yeah, we do. Everybody does. Especially the last week. Especially the last day. For example, the last 24 hours out when I fed, they didn't have any more water after that. All the way to the show. Until maybe a couple hours before. I'd give them that 8 ounce slurry. It's just something to. to so you know. Like a, like a booster. Before the show. I used. Uh, aminos and carbs. You know. Some people don't even like to use carbs. But like I said. Show me your feed keep. And I'll, I'll show you what the carbs are in it. So what they're actually saying. Is they don't like to add carbs. Some people will uh, use a different kind of slurry. Like Bach, he mentions his. I forgot what it was. Some people will use the Pedialyte or the Gatorade before. Just so they'll have that little bit of moisture. Right? So we do monitor the moisture intake. Even though you hear everybody say, I don't take the water away. I, they can have all the water they want. I keep the water there 24-7. That, that's not true in that sense but unless you have someone tell you and explain to you just like i did about you know after the workout you think they you give them water anytime he's thirsty you're blowed out like that you just give him water that's not the time to do it that's when you you got to wait till they're cooled down so everybody monitors the dog's water you know even if you leave it out there during the day you're going to come uh, at some point and see hey did he even drink out of the bowl water bowl that i gave him if he did, how much did he drink? You can eyeball it. You could mark it on the side. You could do however you want. And you're monitoring the moisture intake of your dog. If it gets to the point where he's, depending on the weather too, where he's drinking more and more water every day, you might have a problem. But if he's drinking, you know, about the same every day, you're consistent. You know, it's like I've been told, you know, uh, different times, you know, I weighed my dog today, uh, I weighed my dog, you know, on Tuesday, his rest day was Wednesday, I weighed him on Thursday, and he gained two and a half pounds, how does that happen that he gained two and a half pounds like that, they shouldn't do that, they shouldn't do that, not that, the, the weight can fluctuate a little bit, and I've explained it this way, we feed our dogs daily, right? You give them the same amount. Their weight does not fluctuate. They stay that same weight because we're giving them the same amount of food. So that's the way I looked at it in the keep. I'm feeding them the same. The weight should not fluctuate that much. So for me, that's telling me you're either uh, not measuring the food and supplements and all that, which... That's another piece of advice. You've got to measure everything. And it's got to be accurate measure. And it's got to be consistent. So if you just, you know, let's say you use uh, 
a chicken breast or a chicken leg quarter, right? I give them one a day. If you don't weigh it, depending on the size of the chicken, one day you're giving them a small leg, the other day you're giving them a big leg, just like that. It's not the same. Some may be covered in more fat, less fat, no fat, all that. So all that has to be measured out. If you're given a tablespoon of a supplement, then that means one tablespoon. It doesn't mean you scoop the, use the tablespoon, scoop it, and there's a little mound over it. Today there may, it may be flat. Tomorrow it may be a little mound. Tomorrow it may be a big mound. So one tablespoon is one tablespoon. That means you scoop it up, scrape it, flatten it off. You're getting on that. You want to give them a quarter, uh, 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 a tablespoon plus a teaspoon. Then you give them a tablespoon flat. And you get a teaspoon flat like that. You don't get the tablespoon and go like that. And then I oh, just get a little bit more and go like that. No. Everything has to be measured accurately. So that's how I see the great fluctuation in a dog's weight. Because they're not measuring their food or... They pork the fluid to them. And if it's just fluid, that's not a problem. They just piss it out, you know. Overhydrating is not that problem in that sense to where, you know, uh, they're going to retain this water weight for, you know, a long period of time. No, you walk them out to piss, they'll, they'll get rid of it. They're going to piss longer. They may piss a couple of more times, but they'll get rid of the water. Some people have a problem with their dog drying out early in the key one solution this is the old method you just give them a little bit of salt salt retains moisture they they uh you know they'll uh retain more moisture they'll hydrate again and then you know uh you may, you may have to give them salt for two or three days in a row i wouldn't recommend any longer than that but like that and you'll see their uh hydration pick up then you just back off the saw, make sure they have the electrolytes, make sure they have fluid. You know, when you get towards the end of the keep, that's one of the reasons, you know, I put a cup of water, uh, fluid in their, in their feed because they won't drink. I don't want them dehydrated. I want them dried out. And like I said, that little bit of moisture, it's giving them the electrolytes, which keeps them from dehydrating. And whatever water liquid is in there, they piss it out when I take them to walk out. So these are just some tips. I wrote some stuff down here. Uh, that about covers it. I'll, uh, I'll, you know, do some more on this. Some of this we talk about in the other chats I'm in. Or I'm asked questions in other chats. So the information, not just from me, but other people, it's out there. So I encourage you to watch the ones that where these guys have experience and they give good information. And even the younger guys who don't have a lot of uh, experience and information, they ask the right questions. That to me is interesting. That's where I pick up some of the new stuff too. Even some of these young guys that are educated and love to study and love to check things out. You get a lot of good information from them. So... Let me know what you think. Again, uh, Ruby, School Baby told me to say this, you know, press the like button and subscribe. And and uh, my cash app is, uh, what is it? Uh, tw <laughs> dollar sign schoolboy 2023. She's mouthing it to me so I can hear what she says. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, any merch or anything like that. Even questions, you can get a hold of me on Facebook Messenger. My email, richardjschoolboy60 at gmail.com or on Instagram. And I'm always willing to help. Thanks everybody for your support.